Good morning, Venture Church. How are we feeling this morning? Man, oh my goodness. I cannot tell you how grateful and excited I am. We are uh, to be here with you guys this morning uh, to, uh, because for, for us, for my family and I, we call this place home. We spent a lot of time here and we built a lot of relationships here. So to be back here is so exciting uh, to, to, to be at home, to see so many faces that we call family. And actually to also see a bunch of faces that we don't recognize, which is also exciting because that I means this place is growing and more people are able to come and hear the good news about Jesus and be loved on by this place. And I know for some of those new faces out there, for us, you're like, cool, who is this guy and wh- who cares? I understand. That's, that's understandable. And it'll make a lot more sense in just a minute. But first, I want to preface our time this morning together uh, with laying out a sort of a road map uh, of what the morning is going to look like, talking about uh, what we're going to talk about and why, because it's going to be a little different of a Sunday morning than what you're used to. Still some similar, you know, come, sing some songs, uh, have communion, still uh, a teaching time, and you leave. The difference is the 30 minutes that I get or so, um, it, it's going to be more like a family time. It's going to be more like a family meeting. We're going to catch you guys up on some of the things that's been going on with us. Uh, and, and so I want to uh, invite you into this family meeting. What, again, what do I mean by family meeting? Well, what happens at family meetings normally? Uh, you know, besides drama, fighting, yelling, swearing, and feelings getting hurt, what... <laughs> Actually, a better question is what's supposed to happen at a family meeting, right? Uh, you, you get together, you share how life is, you, maybe, maybe some hugs, how the kids, and maybe you talk about some serious things in a civilized manner. And that's what's going to happen this morning. So I want to invite each and every one of you, whether you know us or not, into this family meeting, into our time together where we're going to let you know what's been going on with us. Um, so uh, first, I'm going to share a little bit about my story and how Venture has become an integral part of our us, the Cartwright story, uh, for those of you who may not know us. Uh, then I want to update you guys on, on how the last nine months have been since we left, primarily for those of you who know us well and have been following our story. And then I want to spend just the last few minutes sharing just a couple of, of things that we've learned that have stuck out to us during our residency. Uh, things that, one, I wish that I had learned a long time ago. It would have helped tremendously. And two, are things that no matter what your relationship with God is this morning, whether you've been following him your entire life or you're still skeptical about who he is, it, it will still serve you well mentally and emotionally and relationally and spiritually. So having, having said all that, having prefaced this, let's get this family meeting rolling. How about that? You guys excited about that? All right. So for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Joe Cartwright. Um, this is a picture of my family. I'll kind of share this for a second if it gets up there. Boom. Okay. So this is us in New Orleans. Um, it's not, it, there's more of my extended family in here, uh, and, and I'll talk about why in a little bit. On the left over there is me, uh, right below in the camouflage tank top. That's my oldest son, Malachi. Uh, at the bottom right in front of him, that's uh, my baby girl, Malin. Uh, and right beside him, to, the, to her, to the right, is Micah. That's my middle boy. And then my wife is in the black uh, shirt right above those two. And so those are, like, there's my uncle in there, and there's my brother on the left-hand side. Uh, funny story, really quick, the one uh, crouching down right there, that's my cousin, uh, who I just found out, uh, like, four years ago that she's my cousin. Uh, so that is kind of a whole 23andMe fun story. It's wild. My family's crazy. So, <clears throat> so here's my family. Um, myself, <clears throat> I grew up in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, it's kind of the rougher, yeah, 757, let's go. <clears throat> it's a rougher part of the Chesapeake or the Hampton Roads area. And for me, uh, like a lot of us, making bad choices and not not doing everything that we're supposed to, I got involved early on with uh, the wrong people, wrong people group. And so I got plugged into a gang, and I started making bad choices. And that led to, over time, um, some poor decisions in a situation where, at one point, my life was in jeopardy. Um, some of these people in this gang were trying to, to kill me and take my life. And I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. 
uh, had never been in this situation before. Obviously, I'm, this is late middle school, early high school. So it's, it's a lot to process. Um, <clears throat> but the only thing that I knew to do at the time was I was in and out of church in a, a church in North Virginia. And so I had been, <clears throat> there's this guy named Chris Woolard, uh, who you all know very well, uh, lead pastor of this church. He was the youth pastor at the, the church where I was at at the time. Excuse me. And so he's the, he, he, for some reason, he saw something in me, and he took time to come and, and be intentional and, and get to know me. So this guy is the only person that I knew to, to go to with this information. I'm not, definitely not going to my parents with it. Hey, mom and dad, I'm in a gang. People are trying to kill me. Um, th- that just didn't seem like the best idea. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, well, let me go to this guy who calls himself a pastor. Maybe he's safe. I can talk to him about it. So I did. Um, they obviously didn't get a hold of me, and I'm still here to this day, uh, but he helped, he helped change the course of my life forever. And so from there, uh, he, he saw a lot in me. He helped me get into Bible college. Uh, so I go to Bible college. I'm a knucklehead. I'm not the greatest student in the world. To begin with, over time, it gets better and gets better. Um, and from there, I graduate, and then I start <clears throat> to get into ministry, I start off working at a, a church in the Outer Banks, actually with his uh, brother, where his brother works, and started there, did some other little ministries uh, throughout. Uh, when we were done in the Outer Banks, we decided to move to uh, Hickory, North Carolina, uh, which is the western part of the state, and that's where I got my first exposure to church planting. I was like, whoa, th- there's this place where you can, can try different things. You can pretty much do anything short of sin to try to reach those who are lost and broken. I'd never seen anything quite like it. And I was like, this is incredible. I want to do something like this myself. And that's where I felt uh, God kind of putting it on my heart to, to plant a church myself. So that led into a process of having conversations, um, to uh, going through a church planting assessment, trying to figure out what was the next step. And so that Trying to fly through this for those of you who don't know me is a lot. But that took us out to Colorado Springs, Colorado, where we spent about three years uh, in full-time ministry. It was my first full-time ministry. And it was a great experience up until the point that it wasn't. Uh, and in 2020, actually early, uh, middle 2019, there was some leadership changeover at the church. And that can be good, and that can be rough, and it can be bad. It can come with its own types of things. And it was a little difficult, a little challenging um, and so with that leadership changeover, at the same time that was happening and kind of some friction and some butting of some heads with myself and, and other people uh, on the leadership team, <clears throat> we also moved my mom out to live with us. And to, um, she had been battling breast cancer and she just didn't have anything left in Norfolk and we wanted to take care of her. She come have a place to stay with us and we will help take care of her and she can help take care of the kids. It'll work out, be the greatest thing ever. Uh, invite your mom to come live with you. It's an awesome idea. Um, <clears throat> so leadership changeover, invite my mom to come out with us. Um, job situation is kind of up in the air and I'm, I'm starting to have to make some decisions. Um, oh, because by the way, it wasn't the greatest decision of all time to bring my mom to live with us. Uh, that was actually very difficult. Uh, and so that, plus leadership, um, and then that summer, my, my dad, oh, sorry, and also 2020, it was, um, what happened? Oh, yeah, COVID. So in the middle of COVID, I'm also trying to uh, figure out how do I do ministry well in isolation, the same thing that everybody on the planet was trying to do, and it was really difficult. New leadership changeover. Uh, my mom was living with us, uh, who, who thought that she was the better parent um, in, in every situation. Um, so she's really good at parenting while we were in the room. Um, <laughs> COVID's happening. Uh, and then in tw- at the summer of 2020, my, I get a call that my dad's in the hospital. And uh, at the time, I thought it was going to be okay, uh, but then it, then it wasn't really quickly. And about a week later, he passed away. So 2020 was awful, to say the least. Uh, specifically for me, and it was one of the darkest times of my life. I lost my dad. I was losing my job. Um, my, my mom situation was not good. I was like, okay, where do I go? What do I do? So we left Colorado, and we came back to Wilmington uh, because that's where my wife's family were, family were, and it was the only place that we knew where we'd have a place to sleep. Didn't have a job. Didn't have a place to go on my own. Didn't have enough money to just jump right in. It was really difficult. 
And so we came back here and we lived with family. And again, in that season, um, I didn't know what I was supposed to do anymore. I wasn't sure uh, that I was even called to ministry. I didn't know if I was qualified enough anymore to, um, for God to use me in the kingdom because of, of all the things that had happened up to that point. So I come here, I'm like, I don't know what to do. God, I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of mad at you, and I'm, gonna, I'm just done with ministry. But for some reason, I, he continued to lay on my heart and tug on me and say, man, I'm not done with you yet. Like, take a deep breath, relax. It's hard. Life's hard. It happens. But what you don't know, and again, God, I feel not literally speaking to me, but what I feel like God saying was, what you don't know is you're about to find this place called Venture. And I knew Venture because Chris, me and Chris go way back, and I knew about this church plan. I had been here. What I didn't know is what this church would become for us. And this church and Chris and the staff, in a lot of ways, saved my life. Specifically, I mean, from, from the time I was a teenager up until the time where I just didn't know what I was going to do with my life. This was a safe place for us to land, for uh, us to just feel welcome and safe. And eventually we got plugged in uh, to... To, to all different types of ministry, we started, I started to be able to play in the band, which was great. I'm a musician, and so I love being able to jump back and do that. And slowly over time, as I'm getting plugged in here, getting plugged into a small group, um, I was also trying to figure out what the heck do I do for a job. So I started doing DoorDash and just driving around the city for 60, 70 hours a week, all day, every day, for two and a half years. Um, it paid the bills, but it was a lot of work. And again, the whole time I'm like, what am I doing? I still didn't feel God being done with us. And so throughout that time, Chris, again, being the, the, the great godly man that he is and the kingdom-minded person that he is, continued to provide me and my family a safe place to be, to call home. He gave me opportunities to lead. I, I was able to preach multiple times. Um, he, he allowed me to come on as a part-time or like a, a volunteer staff overseeing groups he, they asked me to step into a deacon role that I was able to, to again, another leadership opportunity before we, we left here. But time after time after time, this place said yes to us when I wasn't sure if anybody else was. Amen. And so that's why this place is so important to us. That's why we call this place home. And so it, during that season, uh, about two and a half years into being here, we're like, okay, let's do it. Let's go, let's go plant a church. Let's get back on the saddle. Uh, let, let's, let's get in the game, and let's start fighting again. Because, again, God said, I'm not done with you yet. There's just some deserts that you got to go through. There's some things that you have to learn. There's some ways that you need to grow. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, and that's what happened. So we started to make some phone calls, have some conversations with some people, and see, okay, what's the right next step when it comes to church planting? So we reached out to some organizations. Um, we had phone calls with, uh, in, with churches, individuals, uh, and, and all that to say we, we landed at a place where I started working with an organization called Waypoint. And they said, hey, we, we believe in you. We, we, we believe you have what it takes. Let's figure out what this looks like to help put you in a place to plant a church. And we're like, let's do it. Game on. Let's go. So at that point, I need to figure out, okay, where am I going to go to do uh, a church planting residency, which is going to a place, it's a fancy way of just saying a year-long training where I go and I put myself into uh, a place where, with a church, and I just learn everything there is to know about church planting. And so that is, um, so from here, Venture sent, sent us out, and uh, we landed at a, a church called Collective Church in Frederick, Maryland, and we've been there for about nine months. Um, and it's been, honestly, I can't, we cannot be more grateful for uh, Collective Church in Frederick, Maryland, for them to take us on and to, to take the, the, as good a care as they have of me and my family, and we've learned so much from being there. Uh, but also, we couldn't be more grateful for this church and the people in it. And you may not know this, but the truth is, it takes a lot of money and a lot of people and a lot of time to plant a church. 
And this church and many of the people in it are some of our biggest supporters, which have allowed us to be in Maryland, to grow, to learn what it looks like to plant a church. And over the last nine months, it's been an incredible ride. Um, One thing I did did leave out, uh, so we actually, um, about two, three weeks ago now, uh, actually, let's go back further, about a month and a half ago, um, I got a call from my mom saying that her uh, breast cancer had come back, and it had uh, metastasized and moved into her throat, her lungs, and her bones. And so I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's, that's not good. Um, and kind of know what happens from there. I just dealt with this, you know, three years ago, four years ago. And so, uh, so we, we, right then there, my wife and I were like, you know, we just, we just got to go. We just got to go be with, with my mom because I, I just don't know how much longer she has. And when my dad passed, it was so sudden and devastating that it wrecked my life. I said, I can't miss this opportunity. So we pause, we drive down uh, to New Orleans uh, where my uncle uh, lives, and he's uh, blessed and had the ability to bring her into hospice, and we took care of her for about a month and a half, and just a couple weeks ago, um, she passed, and she went to uh, be with Jesus. And so it's been a season. It's been a wild ride. Um, But the last nine months have been an incredible experience for a time in um, our time in Maryland, where we've been able to learn and to grow, and for my wife and I to be um, to be the the best church planters that we can be. So, um, with the last little bit of time that we have left, let me let me just. That, that, that's that's our that's my story. That's kind of where um, where I started. Why venture means so much to us. Why we're here. Um, why I play, call this place home. And so I, let, now I want to kind of shift and just talk a little bit about the last nine months specifically, um, and shift gears. And then I'm going to leave you just with a couple nuggets of wisdom and insight that we've learned from Collective that again has changed our perspective on life, on ministry, and, and it's just so good. Um, so a couple things in the last nine months. Uh, first thing is this, since being in Maryland, in case you were wondering or ever planning on moving to uh, Maryland, it's cold there. Uh, it's very cold. Uh, it snows a lot, and it's really cold. It's very cold, right? Okay, so that, that's a thing. Um, and we live in an RV <clears throat> because we really just love each other so much, and... Uh, <laughs> I mean, what I meant is it's really expensive to live up there, and um, so, so that, like, th- that was the only option uh, for us. Really tight experience, if you could imagine. Um, but the other piece of being in an RV is that, uh, and being in a cold place, is that if you have exposed pipes and you don't insulate them and heat them and take care of them, um, they will get frozen. And so uh, that's what happened. We, uh, for apparently for the last couple years, uh, the Maryland had had like a drought when it come to snow and like really, really cold. They didn't have a bad cold season in a long time. So we're like, they're like, oh, you, you'll be fine. We weren't fine. Uh, we did not insulate the bottom. We did not do what we were supposed to to make sure that we were good. So uh, one night we wake up and there's like 10 feet of snow on the ground and all of our pipes are frozen and I didn't have a chance to dump the tanks the night before. So we have completely frozen solid uh, water and waste pipes and we're just stuck with nothing um, to the point where we just had to use a bucket for just a little while to get by. And so it it was a difficult uh, little season there. Other fun thing is when it does start to to warm up, like what happens? Pipes thaw out. It's a good thing. Uh, Unless you go to use the sink and, and you're like, oh, man, why is it no wor- water work? Oh, it's frozen. And you forget to push the, the handle back and turn it off. So we go to church, and uh, one, of my, one of my sons had uh, opened up the, the thing to try to use the water, forgot to turn it back and close it. Yes, thank you, Malachi, for owning that. I appreciate it. Extreme ownership, good. <clears throat> and so, so, so we're, like, we're like, oh, man, okay, that's good. We got to go to church. And we were gone for like eight hours. And so it was really hot that day. It was great. It was perfect. Uh, and they thought out why we were gone. So we come home uh, to, I kid you not, what looked like an ocean in our RV. There was so much water 
all over the entire place. Thank the Lord that like we didn't completely stabilize the RV and it had a little bit of a lean because most of it went out of the RV onto the ground. So like a mini pool outside under the RV. Uh, so if you ever want to move to Maryland or up north, it's cold. And if you live in an RV, just know it's important to take care of the underbelly. Uh, two, if you're a sports fan, you'll understand this. Maryland is loaded with Orioles fans, and I am not an Orioles fan. As a matter of fact, I'm a Yankees fan, the greatest baseball team of all time, and, so, and I typically wear a Yankees hat everywhere I go all the time, so I cannot tell you the amount of times I have had an ugly look or heard a certain thing about me wearing a hat like, man, like, you're really brave, or like, uh, like ew, or like just like a, all kinds of things. So much so to the point where we were walking around downtown one time, and uh, this old lady, she... Uh, we were coming out of a, uh, we were going into a store. She was coming out of a store. I had my Yankees hat on, and I'm, I'm, I kid you not, she's 70, 80 years old, and she was like, she's just like, you're really brave to wear that hat in this city. And I was like, thank you, ma'am. It's nice to meet you too. Uh, also, people are not very friendly up north. Just that's another kind of little fun thing to think about. Um, uh, another thing, the third thing is that while we were, while we've been there in uh, Maryland at Collective. For uh, the last nine months, during that season, we had the opportunity and the chance to be able to kind of sneak away for a couple weeks and go visit some cities to try to, to figure out where is it that we're going to plant. That's a big part of planting a church is where are you going to end up. And so through a lot of travel, a lot of visiting multiple cities, uh, through a lot of prayer, uh, a lot of you asking you to be a part of that prayer team and, and just say, hey, listen, help us know and discern what, where God wants us to go. We were able to land on uh, making a decision to plant a church in Wilson, North Carolina. And so we're really, really excited about that. Yeah, please, yeah, clap. That's, we're excited. Um, <clears throat> the, the only difficulty is, which is fine, um, I'm on God's timing, not my own. I've learned that a long time ago that it doesn't work well when I try to figure things out. Um, that's why I was door dashing for two and a half years. Uh, so the, the thing is, is that it will kind of put a kink in the timeline. So because I was gone for, when we get back in August, we'll be gone for two and a half months from our residency, I missed a ton of, of kind of big, pivotal, key uh, moments of training that were supposed to happen. But the thing is, I would not trade it for the world. I spent a month and a half with my mom being able to send her off to heaven well and, and, make sh- and to make sure that I didn't sp- have a lifelong feeling of guilt and shame and regret. So I wouldn't trade it for the world, but everything comes at a cost. Everything has consequences, good or bad. And so now we just have to kind of shift gears. And when we finish up in, uh, in Maryland, uh, up north with our residency there and finish well, we're just going to move back to North Carolina and extend our residency. But we don't know how long yet. We don't know where yet. We're trying to uh, work through all of that. But there's just a, still a couple things that we have to do training-wise um, that, that will be a, a huge part of the process. Uh, so... Uh, let's see, was there something? Oh, and the last thing, just to kind of brag on collective. The church that we're going to right now, uh, they have a kingdom-minded heart. So the, us going there, we've learned how to do everything short of sinning to reach those who are far from Jesus, who have not said yes to Jesus, how to manage people, how to manage loving people well, how to, how to lead a staff well. These guys have, in their lifetime, I think, baptized over, what, 200 now? They're pushing 200 at this point. They're six years old. They're running 600 people. They're knocking it out of the park. And so we are so grateful to be a part of this team. I couldn't thank them enough. And we've, again, it has impacted us more than, I just, it's, it's hard to even describe. So that's wrapping up the last nine months or the last 36 years of my life, you know, whatever you want to call it. So I appreciate you sitting here listening to our story, just to get a little bit more perspective of why I'm here, why Venture exists, because Venture not only exists to love this community, to love the city, to help people know, love, and follow Jesus, but they also exist to replicate, to send people out, because they believe in planting churches, that plant churches, that reach lost people, that help people who have already said yes to Jesus continue to grow in their faith. So that is why this place is important to us. That's what we've been doing over the last nine months. And I don't have a ton of time left and I have a lot more to say. I'll be back again, and I'm going to talk some more because, uh, again, I love this place. I, I might even think about just taking Chris's job. Um, 
<clears throat> so so let, let me fly through real quick. There's three things I wanted to share with you guys. The first two I'm going to run through really quick, and the last one I want to spend the most amount of time on, and then we'll wrap up, we'll, we'll pray, and we'll get out of here. Uh, two things that, that we've learned, uh, three things. The first two things, um, the first one is this. If you're taking notes, write this down this morning. Better before bigger. Better before bigger. Um, this is a principle uh, that I, I think is kind of self-explanatory, but the idea is, is this. Um, before anything in, in your life can grow and, and, and move on and be better, you gotta, or, or to be bigger, to have more, you got to make sure that everything that you can do, that you do that thing to make sure it's the best that it can possibly be. You can't move on. You can't think and wish and hope and want bigger, want more, without making sure that the front end, the basis, is the best that it can possibly be. So the way it looks like in ministry is, okay, well, we can't move to uh, two services or three services until we make sure that the service that we have is full and that it's done well. That, but personally, the way that it looks like, what does it look like for us? What area of your life would you love to be bigger, but you just can't figure out why it's not where you want it to be? Maybe you can't get the better job or get the business up uh, off the ground or climb the corporate ladder because you can't get along with anybody at your current job. You're always late, and your work habits are mediocre at best. Maybe you've wanted to be married for forever, but you just can't seem to find the one because your dating standards are too low. You settle for anyone and will say yes and compromise the standards that you know that God has for your dating life. Until we're willing to do all that we can, the best that we can, in whatever area of our life, we can't expect bigger to just happen. And we definitely don't need to aim for bigger. Instead, we need to focus on better, and bigger will come. So that's one of the first things that we learned uh, is better before bigger. The second principle is this, again, if you're taking notes, be a thermostat, and not a thermometer. Be a thermostat, and not a thermometer. Again, I'm going to fly through this one. The, the basic idea of this is, uh, I'll, just, I'll read this, setting the tone for the atmosphere, the culture, the systems, et cetera, that you want in place, and not letting the temperature of those things, uh, of things that may happen, determine your tone. So, for example, you put standards into place, you set the tone for the way that you want your life to be, for whatever area it is that you have in your life to be, so that, um, that you know this is how it's going to be in my life, instead of waiting for things to happen and then having to pivot and adjust and, oh, man, it's just hot in this room. we got to do something about it. So set the temperature, set the tone, uh, and not let the tone uh, set you. Parents, uh, w w what about us? What about you? Parents, are you frustrated that your family's spiritual situation isn't where you want it to be because you haven't put into place a standard of praying together or digging into God's word together, together on a daily basis? Students, uh, are you angry with your, yourself because you continue to make poor choices with certain friends because you're more, more concerned about being noticed than saying no to people entering your inner circle of influence that don't belong there? People dating, do you repeatedly find yourself in the same position of going too far physically or even worse, premarital sex, because you didn't take the time to set the boundaries on the front end of what is and isn't too far? As followers of Jesus or anybody, we're called to, be the, we're called to set the temperature where it's supposed to be, not react to a situation when the temperature is too hot or too cold. So that's the first two things. The last thing is this. Uh, this principle, it, the last thing is this, lean in, lean in. Um, oh, man, so many good things. I just, yeah, you know what? I ah, forget it. Um, so so uh, I'm going to put this picture up here on the screen real quick. Uh, my wife is, uh, she's what some people would call crunchy. And she, uh, she's, she's, she's into oil, she's into all naturals, this is and natural that. She's got a cauldron in the basement. The list goes on, right? She's just, she, she just it's, it's, a, it's a whole thing. So does anybody know what this is? Okay. All right, one. Baseball cleats, that's funny. It does look like that. This is called uh, an acupuncture mat. 
uh, or acupressure mat. I apologize. Acupressure mat. So the other day, uh, I find her laying on this mat that she had gotten, um, and, and I walk in, and she just got this grin on her face, and I'm like, what is going on right now? Um, so she kind of, she like leans over, and she shows me uh, this mat, and I'm real skeptical. I'm a natural skeptic, just in general, um, but I'm real skeptical because I see it, and I'm like, what the heck is this? It, if you go put your hand on this right now, you might go to the hospital. It, it's that sharp. It, it's ridiculous. I'm just like, what are you doing laying on this mat? But because I'm a good husband, um, I gave it a try, and, I, I, and here's the truth. I, I like to, to like the things that my wife likes. It typically works out well for me. Husbands, healthy marriage advice and tip. Try to like the things that your wife likes. It's a good idea. It's a good principle. Um, so I lay down on this thing, and, I, and I'm like, this is one of the worst experiences of my life. This is so painful. Oh, oh, that's nice. And it hurts so good. That night, I actually had one of the best night sleeps that I had in a long, long time. But instead of blowing it off and not caring, instead I leaned in and I experienced this torture device. <laughs> and I actually ended up sleeping amazing that night. And my wife was actually impressed with me that I jumped right in, even though I had no idea what it was. I leaned in. This is one of those things that we've heard at Collective over and over and over and over again from stage in groups, through communication, no matter, everywhere you go, you hear the words, lean in. Write those words down and don't forget them. What do I mean by lean in? Here's a, a, just a simple definition. Commit completely or more fully to something, especially when faced with difficulty or resistance. Leaning in really boils down to the difference between being passive and being active. Passivity versus activity. It means being in the game and not just in the stands. Unfortunately, this is a big issue in the church and mainly an issue for the ones who call themselves followers of Jesus. I mean, too many people show up as spectators and consumers and never get in the game. But again, if we're being honest, church isn't the only place that this happens. And there's a lot of areas of our, in our lives where we opt out of leaning in. We choose being passive over being active. Here's the sad truth about choosing to not lean in to the areas of our lives where it matters most. It causes us to be stuck. Write this down as well if you're taking notes. Passivity prohibits progression. Passivity prohibits progression. When we choose to do nothing, we typically get nothing. When we choose to do something, we often get more than we imagine. And I know this to be true for two reasons, uh, and I'm going to share these two reasons, and then we're going to wrap this thing up and get out of here. Um, uh, the first reason is we see this playing out in God's word during Jesus' life. So there's this story uh, in John chapter 4 where uh, Jesus is traveling um, from south to north, uh, from Jerusalem uh, to, to head north, and the route that he has to take, most people, Jews specifically, uh, they go around this area. There's an uh, area in the middle called Samaria. This place is, is hated by Jews, and uh, the, they hate the place, they hate the people, they just don't want to go there. They, they're kind of the lowest of the low. So most of them will travel around to bypass it. Jesus went and traveled through it. It's something that he, he, he chose to do, it's something that he actually had to do. But while he was there, he met this woman who was drawing water out of a well. And, and maybe you know the story, and, and you, you remember what happens, but he has this conversation with her, and he's like, listen... He's like, I need some water. She's like, there's a lot to the story. Again, trying to speed up a little bit. She's like, I can't get you water. Like, that's not for me to do. He's like, okay, well, regardless, I've got a different type of water for you. I have living water, and I'm that living water. It lasts forever, and, and if you will sip from my cup, it will change your life for eternity. The gist of the story. But go, go read it, John chapter 4. I really encourage you to read the story. The cool thing about it is what happens at the end. Uh, in, in John chapter 4, the woman's response is what blows me away. This is what it says. Just then his disciples returned. Uh, this is uh, John 4, starting at 27. Then, just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come 
see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and they made their way toward him. Jumping over to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him, and because of the woman's testimony, he told me everything I had done. This Samaritan woman could have simply heard the message, told Jesus, thank you, appreciate it, it's good stuff, buddy, and went about her day. But instead, she knew what she had just heard was way too important to do nothing with. She chose to lean in to what Jesus had just told her, to be active with the message that she had just heard, and to let her people know that this would change their lives forever. It's the first reason. Scripture speaks to this idea of leaning in. Second reason is this. Um, science backs it up. In 2021, Baylor University did a study on trauma and the impact of Bible reading. Their findings were insane. They found that combining education about mental health best, best practices with Bible reading reduced the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and increased forgiveness, compassion, and a sense of purpose. The study showed that people who read their Bible regularly showed a drop in feelings of depression, anxiety, and anger. They also showed a drop in something called complicated grief, which is a, a, deni a denial of traumatic events. It's a type of coping mechanism. They saw drops in negative effect and also avoiding activities associated with trauma. Uh, people that read their Bible had a drop in depression and fewer suicidal thoughts, and they saw an increase in forgiveness and compassion and reported increased rates of resiliency, resi resiliency, the ability to bounce back. The Baylor researchers said they expected to see some differences, but they didn't anticipate how clear that it would be. Here's another study. In the middle of the pandemic, Harvard did a study on Bible reading, and the correlation between scripture reading and hope were strong. Frequent Bible readers rated themselves as 33% more hopeful than irregular scripture readers. The study also found that those who read their Bible regularly, their hope grew as they continued to read. Here's just a couple more random stats when it comes to reading your Bible. Reading the Bible four more times per week decreases your odds of drinking in excess by 62%, viewing pornography by 59%, having sex outside of marriage by 59%, lashing out in anger by 31%, gossiping by 28%, neglecting family by 26%, overeating by 20%, mishandling money by 20%, feeling bitter by 40%, self-destructive thinking by 32%. See where, where I'm going? Feeling the need to hide what you do or how you feel by 32%, having difficulty forgiving others by 31%, feeling discouraged by 31%, Experiencing loneliness by 30%, experiencing fear or anxiety by 14%. Reading the Bible four more times per week gives you significantly higher odds of giving, uh, significantly higher odds of giving to a church by 416%, discipling others by 231%, sharing your faith by 228%. Reading the Bible four more times per week gives you significantly lower odds of feeling spiritually stagnant by 60%, feeling like you can't please God by 44%. I feel like I can speak for every person in this room and say that we would all like more of those percentages that are beneficial and less of the ones that are harmful. And that's whether, you've put, and that's whether you put your faith, hope, and love in Jesus or not. But you see the impact of what leaning in can have on your life. In one area one area of reading your Bible, the impact of leaning in and choosing activity versus passivity. Those percentages are based off of people choosing between, choosing between leaning in to reading their Bible or letting it sit on the shelf and collecting dust. And that's just one area of our lives. We're making the decision to lean in and be active instead of lazy, passive, and sitting in the stands doing nothing will drastically improve the quality of your spiritual life. The same can be true for other areas of our lives, emotional, physical, relational. Think about this. What would happen if you cared a little less about your own desires and you leaned into understanding your wife better? How much better would your marriage be? 
What would happen if you took a risk, you stepped out in faith, you leaned into counseling to work through some guilt, some shame, some regret, maybe some other baggage that you have from trauma that you haven't experienced or that you've experienced in the past? What would happen if you stepped out and stepped into some counseling? What would happen if you carved out some time or made it a priority to lean into a small group here at Venture? How much better would your relationships be? How much healthier would your social life be? What would happen if you leaned into your faith and made praying every day, serving at church on Sunday, and getting to know your neighbors so you could share your faith with them a priority? Not to mention reading your Bible, which we just talked about. You see the benefits. How much better would your relationship with Jesus be? Let me ask one last question, and then I'll close this out. What area of your life could benefit from you choosing to be active versus being passive? Choosing to lean in and commit completely to whatever that thing is. Uh, Again, I can't thank this place enough for the impact that it's had on our lives and our ministry and the impact that we will have on the kingdom moving forward. Thank you from the Cartwrights for supporting us, for loving us in the season. Again, some of the darkest times of our lives, some of the best times of our lives. And I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, whether you need to embrace all three of those principles, whether you've been following Jesus for your whole life and you're like, ah, man, things just aren't where they need to be. I, I need to lean in. I need to get back into the game. Or whether you've never said yes to Jesus or not. If that's you this morning, if you've never said yes to, to a relationship with Jesus, to, to lean in to say, okay, what does it mean that I am a broken person who has sinned and, and this I've heard that Jesus has come down from his position in heaven and given up everything to take on my sin and shame and guilt and lay down his life so that I could be free and that I could actually have a way back to spending eternity with the Father in heaven. Whatever, wherever you're at this morning, whatever decision that you need to make, grab the connection cards, uh, Fill those out. Go to the new here. Talk with some of the leaders. Come see myself. Whatever it is, come find us so we can help you make those decisions. This place is an incredible place for you to be, for you to consider making whatever next choice and decision that you need to make. But whatever you do, don't just stay in the stands. Don't just be passive. Be active. Lean in. Be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And focus on being better before bigger. Let's pray.